Thank you, Provost Alan Brinkley, and my good friend Josh, for the kind words of introduction, and thank you for inviting me to participate in the World Leaders Forum this year. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me say at the outset that it is my distinct pleasure to address this august audience of this prestigious university. I'm told that Columbia University is the fifth oldest institution of higher learning in the United States and that you are committed to preserving the guests, the quest for knowledge as more than simply a practical pursuit. Judging from the number of leading minds that are part of the community of Columbia University, I am persuaded to concur with one of your alumni who said that the best things of all human history and thought are inside the rectangle of Columbia University. And so it is indeed a privilege for me to address you on the theme of the Millennium Development Goals from Rwanda's perspective. As you know, Five years ago, the world's leaders met and launched the Millennium Development Goals. They made a solemn pledge to work together to end extreme poverty and hunger, to promote human dignity, to achieve peace, democracy, and environmental sustainability by 2015 or earlier. This was reaffirmed at the Monterey Conference on Financing for Development in March 2002 and at the Johannesburg World Summit on Sustainable Development in September 2002. And in 2004, your very own Professor Jeffrey Sachs led a global team that rolled out a practical, a practical plan to achieve the goals. At the time of the Millennium Summit, the targets for the Millennium Development Goals were judged to be attainable given the amount of wealth and global abundance as well as what Professor Sachs has ably referred to as the greatest technological and scientific explosion of knowledge. And yet, despite this unprecedented creation of wealth and knowledge, there are still frightening levels of poverty for the majority of the world's populations, and many in the developing world continue to die of deprivation, hunger, malnutrition, preventable diseases, and endless conflicts. It is, in my view, unacceptable that today, according to UN statistics, 345 million Sub-Saharan Africans live in poverty. In some sub-Saharan African countries, as many as 70% of the region's population live on less than one dollar a day. 228 million sub-Saharan Africans suffer from undernourishment and 
4.7 million children die each year of hunger and disease. That is an average of nearly 13,000 every day or 500 children dying every hour. Similarly, 280 million people in sub-Saharan Africa have no access to clean and safe drinking water, and 167 million live in slum conditions. Now, these statistics say it all. We need no further statistics to show us that at this rate, Africa is not exactly on track to meet the Millennium Development Goals. In fact, in some targets like poverty, GDP per capita, and undernourishment, there will be a regression in the situation between now and, 15, and 2015 if left to business as usual. Some have, of course, argued that there is no one else to blame. And I agree that we Africans must take first responsibility for this sort of state of affairs on our continent. But that's not to deny the fact that in this increasingly shrinking world or global village, as it has been referred to, all nations are interdependent, whether they are big or small, rich or poor. And also, that a world where the majority live in such a solid state, or less than one dollar a day, amidst the highest recorded global productivity and concentration of wealth, is an unsafe world. In fact, such a world is dangerously prone to manipulations by those whose interest in violence, international terrorism, and genocide preys on the hopelessness of the deprived. Equally, we must acknowledge that this interdependence engenders shared responsibilities and obligations, which undoubtedly include the imperative for development and attainment of Millennium Development Goals. We must collectively agree that development is liberation from want and from fear so that all peoples can live dignified lives. All peoples, not some. But judging from the status of play in sub-Saharan Africa, as I have just outlined, the picture is not promising unless we devise together with our development partners and agree to faithfully implement innovative and practical measures that can reverse the current trends. In Rwanda, we recognize the importance of the Millennium Development Goals, and you see them as prerequisites and the roadmap for the realization of our own vision of 2020 the blueprint for our social economic development. Besides their targets, the 
embedded, besides the targets are embedded in our poverty reduction strategy, a program of economic growth in place since 2000 that aims to generate wealth and increase choices for the poor. So clearly, we are determined to do our bit. And although there are still bottlenecks, we seem to be making significant progress. For instance, in goal number two, we have introduced universal primary education, and as a result, we have attained over, we have obtained over 90% primary one enrollment and net enrollment in the primary schools of 82%. We have striven to promote gender equality in all sectors of Rwandan life, and we have attained the 50, 50 ratio of enrollment of girls and both and uh, of girls and boy child in primary education contained in the Millennium Development Goal number three. As for gender equality in decision-making organs, we now have a ratio of 49% women in the parliament and 35% in the cabinet. We are, I think, to a great extent on track in the areas of gender parity and universal primary education. That said, I wish I could be as optimistic for the other goals. We are doing our best, but like other African countries, there is no way we can achieve the Millennium Development Goals without a true partnership at the local, national, and between developed and developing countries based on our shared commitment and determination to promote economic and social advancement of all peoples. This will necessitate, on the part of our development partners, three cardinal things in development financing. First, improvement in the quality and quantity of official development assistance, or DA. Second, fair trade. And third, debt cancellation, which several countries in Africa, including Rwanda, are now benefiting from. The quality of official development assistance should be improved by adopting needs-based approaches providing more budget support, supporting and harmonizing with the national poverty reduction programs, reducing waste and overheads, and by channeling aid to sectors that enhance productive capacities rather than those that perpetuate dependence. There should also be greater consultation, coordination, harmonization, and policy coherence among official development assistance recipients and donors. Effective official development assistance should be untied to procurement of overpriced equipment and consultants 
from donor countries. All these proposals are contained in both the Montreal Consensus as well as the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, which must be implemented. Distinguished audience, the global commitment to achieve the Millennium Development Goals in the next 10 years requires massive mobilization of financial resources and their immediate deployment for immediate employment. We welcome the decision by some developed countries to substantially increase their volume of official development assistance over the last few years. We also congratulate those states that have reached or exceed the international agreed 0.7% of GNI for official development assistance target and welcome the decision by those states that have set timetables to achieve or exceed that target by the year 2015. These commitments should significantly improve the prospects of many developing countries to attain the Millennium Development Goals. But for these resources to be effective in the attainment of the Millennium Development Goals, their disbursement should be accelerated, flexible, and predictably available for implementation. Fair trade will entail committing ourselves, both in principle and practice, to an open, rule-based, non-discriminatory and equitable multilateral trading system. Any progress that developing countries like Rwanda might achieve in attaining the Millennium Development Goals will not be sustainable unless measures are taken at the same time to provide a great opportunity to access the richer markets of the developed world and thereby increase household and national incomes. In this regard, we welcome and support the proposal for duty-free and quota-free market access for all exports from least developed countries to the markets of developed countries, as well as the proposal to ease supply-side constraints and commodity price shocks in least developed countries to enable them to take the fullest possible advantage of increased market access. All our eyes are set on the successful completion of the WTO Doha Round of Multilateral Trade Negotiations in 2006 and implementation of the Doha Development Agenda paying due regard to agricultural trade issues, liberalization of trade in services, and the promotion of export competitiveness. The recent decision to cancel the debt of 18 highly indebted least developed African countries is a very commendable manifestation of the commitment by those countries to the, developed, to the development of least developed countries. Rwanda is one of the 18 countries that qualified for debt cancellation. For our debt once, our debt once stood at US dollars 1.2 billion 
whose annual servicing at the time was 523% of exports earnings. Cancellation of our debt means that the government can now channel nearly 40 million US dollars, which is previously spent annually on debt servicing, towards improving or expanding social service delivery around the country. The challenge now is to access sufficient grant-based development financing that will prevent the reversal of our debt sustainability while providing the needed investment for economic growth and poverty reduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear to us that attainment of Millennium Development Goals is also contingent on a good political and economic governance. In Rwanda, we have implemented several political and economic reforms over the last decade including democratization and decentralization of the central and local governments. We have put in place institutions that promote accountability and transparency, and we have introduced measures that combat corruption and abuse of public office. We have also implemented a, service, a series of measures to ensure fiscal discipline, to eliminate waste in the public sector, while also boosting trade and inward investment. We will continue to do what it takes in this process, particularly in the area of good political economic, and corporate governance. May I add that while we view improvements in governance as a continuum and a dynamic process rather than a static end goal, we believe that we have made significant progress which gives us reason to be optimistic that with enhanced support of our development partners, we could attain the Millennium Development Goals targets by the year 2015. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by reiterating that the socio-economic development of our countries and the emancipation of our people is primarily our responsibility. But the Millennium Development Goals are a compact between rich and poor, and rich countries must honor their commitments and fulfill their obligations that accompany these commitments. I'm pleased to assure you that for Rwanda, the will and the enthusiasm for achieving the MDGs is there. What remains to be seen is the same commitment on the part of our development partners. We believe that we cannot afford to miss this opportunity that has the potential to change the welfare of so many in the world. But while we differ and prevaricate, children continue to die of starvation and preventable diseases. 
others go to bed and fail to sleep because they are hungry. This is not the kind of world we want to bequeath to the generations to come in this new millennium. I wish to say thank you for your kind attention and I will appreciate your questions and comments. Thank you very much.